أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والشمس وضحاها والقمر إذا تلاها والنهار إذا جلاها والليل إذا يغشاها والسماء وما بناها والأرض وما طحاها ونفسها وما سواها بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والشمس وضحاها والشمس وضحاها والقمر إذا تلاها والنهار إذا جلاها والليل إذا يغشاها والليل إذا يغشى والسماء وما بناها والأرض وما طحاها ونفس وما سواها فألهمها فجورها وتقواها قد أفلح من زكاها وقد خاب من دساها ثمود بطغواها إذ انبعث أشقاها فقال لهم رسول الله فقال لهم رسول فكذبوه فعنقروها فدمدم عليهم ربه بذنبهم فسواها ولا يخاف عقباها صدق الله العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, Again, we are with you uh, Last week we had an amazing session with uh, Dr. Hani And he answered uh, many questions that we had And he gave us many insights into uh, his trip to Bosnia and to Turkey And Inshallah, today we're going to ask him a few more questions, Inshallah, and that's uh, the best thing that we can do is to ask you questions and gain knowledge uh, from people who have experience as well, Inshallah. Um, today we're going to discuss a few things, uh, namely in the humanitarian sector, human ethics, the values and the relationship.
questions a few days ago that you part uh, part took in, where three uh, people they spoke about certain. So we want to ask you questions on these uh, topics. So the values and their relationship to humanitarian work. This was by delivered by Dr. Isam al Bashir. The second was the importance of research and history. And that was with Dr. Hussein Abdul Fattah. And then the was the thought of humanitarian work and the culture of its institutions by Dr. Hussein Al Qazaz. So, uh, my first question for you, Dr. Hani. Okay. Yeah. My first question for you, Dr. Hani. Could you kindly talk? Has it come back? Or oh, this is not, this is wrong? Sorry for the Wi-Fi. And uh, try to change the setting from being a traditional boardroom into sitting in a cafeteria. Anybody can walk in, ask question for us. Uh, today is very hot in UK. And this will remind us with an ayah uh, in the Quran about the hellfire. Unfortunately, uh, we could not be able to stand, uh, to tolerate a temperature of 35 or 32 or 36 or 30 in UK. And the people have to realize that the heat, unfortunately, in hell is not 35 or 36. This is one thing which is extremely important uh, for all of us. Uh, come back to your question. The motive of having this is in our humanitarian and social work. We are very traditional. I've been uh, doing uh, what has been done for tens of years. Program, projects, finance, good governance, capacity building, uh, regulation, uh, all these kind of things. And we are very, very, very busy uh, with the philosophy of firefighting. We always respond to the problem. We do not actually think ahead to prevent the problem. And this is what has been happening to most of the Muslim charities and most of the Arab charities, unfortunately. Firefighters and uh, traditional. Fundraising. Uh, most of the organization will be only interested in fundraising. Uh, we decided this time to think differently and to do what we love. I just had discussion with one of my colleagues here, uh, Ziad or Mu'taz? Ziad, who love history. And I'm encouraging him to have his YouTube channel actually, and let people to love what he loves and follow what he asks them to follow, which is history. So this time we thought that we have to do what we believe in, talk about new dimensions of humanitarian work, which is philosophy, culture, history, media, economical impact, political impact, huh? research, and the others. That's so why we decided to have this meeting in Istanbul for three days, and most of the dignitaries delivered the same message without any coordination. That means that it was timely and needed. Your second question. Uh, it was clear that the forum is keen on and gives great uh, importance to the values, morals, and historical and identity approach uh, in humanitarian work. In your opinion and in your views, um, what's the importance of this uh, approach in humanitarian work, speaking about morals and values and, uh, and our culture and value in the humanitarian work? Um, and how does this provide solutions in okay. humanitarian work? Not I think, but I believe that any donation is coming to any, to any one of us, whether from the east or west, or from the north or the south, 
is coated by culture. Culture of what? Culture of the philosophy of thinking of the people who give you the money. If you come from the Middle East area, there's a certain culture. If you don't follow it, you don't get the fund. If you come from the West, there's a, there's a different culture. Different culture, which if you don't follow it, they will not give you the money. This culture is reflecting the philosophy of thinking of the people who are running the organizations to give you the fund. The philosophy of thinking of the people who run the organization are reflecting their belief, whether it is religious belief or their own personal belief. So belief, philosophy, and culture. And they force you, they force all of us, especially the people who are not with us in the room here and are watching, they force all of us to follow their cultures, their philosophy of thinking, and even sometimes the religious belief, as sometimes you find some discussion about the role of woman and the role of youth and the gender and, and, and all these sort of things. That's why actually we have to, we have to, to, to ask people in our community, in our organization, to think, to have the time to think, to produce their own culture, to produce their own values, to produce their own philosophy of thinking, and to start to challenge the other cultures, philosophy of thinking, values, morality, and others, inshallah. In the conference, Dr. Assam, uh, Assam he provided, uh, he tried to link Islamic uh, concepts uh, to humanitarian work and the importance of Islamic uh, concepts and Islamic ideas in the humanitarian field. So I'd like to ask you, what's, what do you feel on how, why is it important that we as Muslims, that we bring our Islamic values and our Islamic concepts and Islamic ideas in the humanitarian field. Some would argue that uh, Western charities are extremely successful using scientific management and scientific approaches and their own uh, concepts and their own ideas. But why should we be proud of our identity, I would say, and use our Islamic uh, values and uh, concepts? All right. Thank you. I listened to Dr. Assam uh, talk. We should be very proud no matter what, with our culture, our value, our uh, history, our religion, like the others are. Why shouldn't we be like them? We used to follow them for the last tens of years. The time come that we should produce our philosophy, our value, our culture, our, our, our uh, morality, and let them to follow it. Or actually at least to be partners in the leadership. We can't be the sole leader. We have to be partners in the leadership. Uh, what Dr. Assam put, most of the values, which is Islamic values, is humanitarian values, are broad. He talked about something called Hilf al-Fudul. Hilf al-Fudul was something that the treaty of justice and fight and justice before Islam. And the people who are actually signing up this treaty, all of them were non-Muslim. And the Prophet ﷺ came and said, if I was there, I would have signed up for Hilf al-Fudul. For me now, Hilf al-Fudul, now we have to use it as a syndrome, humanitarian syndrome, sustainable humanitarian syndrome how it should be always helpful for all wherever we go to protect Muslims and non-Muslims and others because you talk about justice to go to about equality talk about fairness so the sustainable way of keeping the syndrome of helpful for all is a humanitarian principle actually with this has been mentioned more than 1,400 years ago, before people start talk about humanitarian or charitable activities. That's why it came back from the background of the Islamic uh, understanding of the social context of the social life of people at that time. Uh, 
Dr. Assam, uh, in his lecture, he said, humanitarian action is an alliance of global, global curiosity based on cognitive and, and practical integration. And he also said, building a carpet is priority than building mosques. Um, what is your comment on this? Uh, building the individual. Yeah. What building, is a carpet? Building a, building a carpet is uh, priority than building mosques. Okay. That's what it is. <laughs> It's, it's a mistake, yeah. isn't it? Individual. Building the individual. Uh, يعني بناء السجد أهم من بناء المسجد. أول. Oh, sorry. This is Google Google yeah. translation. Google translation. You see, when you have your YouTube, don't don't, don't listen to Google all the time, huh? <laughs> And the 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 challenge for us now is we are very uh, uh, selfish. We want our donation to get us to heaven by hook or by crook. I build a mosque because Allah will build for me a palace in heaven. We did not say that I build a mosque to save community, to protect community, uh, to increase the number of people who come to learn about Islam, uh, to educate women, to educate children, to educate everyone. But the people who said, with every stone in the mosque, there's a stone of gold or a stone of silver in heaven. What is the point of building a mosque where children and women are not attending? Well, it's more than half of the community. Yeah. Up till now, in Europe, unfortunately, not in the Middle East, in Europe or in Asia or whatever it is, in Europe and America, there are mosques that do not allow women to come to pray. There's no space, no place for women. And I'm telling the people who are claiming that they are scholars of Islam, you see, at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu mm -hmm. actually, you, we are not more pious than the Prophet Sallallahu mm -hmm. We are not more pious than the companion of the Prophet Sallallahu mm -hmm. And actually, they were, the first lines were for men, like yourself. The second line were for young children, The, the rear part of it was for women, and there was no partition. There was no barriers, there was no wall. Women were there to ask, stand up in the middle of the mosque to listen to the Prophet ﷺ. Actually, those people who believe in building mosques, yes, I'm not against building mosques. Even I mentioned a story about building a mosque which was supported in Albania. In 1992, my first visit to Albania was in December 1991, after I finished my Doctor of Medicine graduation. In 1992, I got young, two young people like yourself. Uh, you are from Egypt. Your wife from, wife Egypt. from Egypt. That means that you are Egyptian. Yeah. If your wife is Egyptian, <laughs> if your wife is Egyptian, Then I'm Egyptian. you are Egyptian. Huh? Uh, and you recite like Abdul Basit or, uh, or, or Minshaw, yeah? Yeah. So whatever it is, you are not Pakistani anymore. Um, I, I don't know Urdu yet. It's not just Egyptian and English. Uh, yeah, Egyptian and English. Other wife, I'll sort you with, with, with your uh, father-in-law and mother-in-law and uh, your wife. And uh, we went, when we in Albania at that time, he said, I said, as Sheikh Hassan said, We need to build the individual before building the mosque, more important. We need the mosque, but we need the individuals at the same time. We're going around, 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 and whenever we go to any city at that time, August 1992, look for the mosque to go there and sit down and uh, find the mosque and start talking about the community. We went to a place called Bugradiz. It's uh, the third city in, in Albania, after Trana and Skodra. And we went to the mountain to see the mosque. We found that the mosque is closed. It was not a mosque, it was Zawiya. So we came down, and uh, the, the, the caretaker of the, of the Zawiya ran after us, said, what do you want? He said, we want the mosque. He said, this is not the mosque. I show you the mosque. He took us to the mufti. The mufti was a very old man. And the, mosque, uh, the mufti sorry, opened his book, and there was an old photograph of the mosque which was built at the time of the Ottoman. He said, this was the mosque, which Anwar Khoja, which was the ruler of Albania for 40 years, destroyed it. Like actually closed mosques and most many mosques and changed them to stables and warehouses and others. Okay? And he changed this into an opera place. Bismillah, mashallah. Very well built. 
as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let him to demolish the mosque, to build the opera building for us to claim the mosque again. In a, in a city like this, in Bogradis, you have to build the mosque. Why? Because there was no other mosque. It's an identity. It's a part of the history. It's a part of the, the, the culture of the area as well. But in a city, we have got 50 or 60 or a town, 50 or 60, 100, 200 mosques. You don't need to build any mosque anymore. You need to build people like you. Inshallah. This is what the Dr. Assam is actually fighting for. In your great field experience, how can charitable and humanitarian work really embody the ship that saved, uh, revived, uh, saved and revived man after death? That, this is what Dr. Saif Abdul Fattah spoke about in the conference. Yeah, Dr. Saif Abdul Fattah was talking about the ship of Noah. And he wanted us to build Safinat Noah. You were there. I will ask you to make a comment later on. So, because I've got one of the great scholars here with us, actually, but he's listening to me, unfortunately. I, I should be listening to him. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Sif Al Fatah was talking about the. Uh, Bismillah, Tfadda. Was talking about the ship of Noah, alayhi salam, to save humanity. Sit anywhere, sit anywhere. To, to, to save humanity. And he wanted us to build a ship for humanity or a humanitarian ship for humanity. What you understand from Dr. Sif Abu Fattah comment is how can we build the ship? We said we have a big body called United Nations, isn't it? And we expect United Nations to protect humanity and to protect the organization, and, 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 and. Unfortunately, United Nations is a government organization, organization, or member state organization, and dictated by five members of the Security Council, where some of them, you find them using their rights to stop any decision by even the General Assembly by others. The recent one was uh, about getting the aid material to go through from Turkey to Syria. Eleven states said yes, well, two states abstained, but one state said no. So one against 13, the decision was denied. That's why United Nations failed to build the ship of Noah. Unfortunately, nowadays, we talk about social and civil society organization, or talk about humanitarian organization. There's a general feeling of reducing the civil liberty spaces for such organizations, mainly from the East. It's coming to the West as well, under the excuse of fighting extremism, fighting radicalism, fighting terrorism. And this, the, this, Civil liberties is shrinking to a point that actually people cannot operate even on a local level. And this was actually what Dr. Seva Fatah was saying about the, the ship of Noah could not be built unless you have a civil liberty uh, space for the organization to flourish. In the West, you find that the governments need the civil liberty organization, the civil uh, civil. Uh, such organization and they think that they are actually complementing the role of the government in the east they're scared of allowing them to grow because they politically be challenging the political leadership that's why there's a big challenge on building the ship of noah on a global level Uh, what is the reality of the interest of charitable humanitarian institutions in the research and intellectual work recommended by Dr. Hussein? Is it possible to say that this is the first forum to shed light on this important point? Uh, unfortunately, it is. Because we have been struggling uh, in the past, struggling to raise funds for research, struggling to raise funds for capacity building, struggling to raise funds for communication and networking, struggling 
to raise fund for writing history, starting to raise fund for understanding the culture of others. All this kind does not become very attractive and very sexy to the donor or to the organization themselves. I give you one example which I made it before. During the flood of in Pakistan, I think 2008 or 2010, anybody can remember? No, you are not Pakistani, yeah? Where do you come from? You are Pakistan, this is No, no, no. It's 2008 or 2010, the flood. Anyway, either a donor called me. No problem. You see, uh, he will teach you history if you, if you connect with him later on. And. Uh, so a donor called me by phone, tell me, told me I gave you $500,000 for, for, for Pakistan. I said, Alhamdulillah. One or two weeks later when I went to Pakistan, found that the, still, the, the, flood, the water for the flood is still there. He called me while I was there. I said, how is it? I said, it's very bad. I said, I'll give you more money. I said, how much? I said, the same. With two telephone calls, actually, we raised one million dollars. I was very happy, alas, because it was emergency. Very attractive to the donor. Very attractive to the donor. I went back to see him in his office in his country. Told him, I need sixty thousand dollars because we are setting up our office in your capital and we want to do A, B, C, D, E, F. Never received this money up till now. This is the way when you look at the donor are very emotional. Only give fun when people are killed, when there's a war, when people are dying, when the woman is they become a victim of rape, or 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 or. But when you ask them to build the community, mm, they're still thinking. Actually, that's why the newly built organization like World Human Action Forum or Muslim Chairs Forum are struggling to find real fund, a good fund to carry on with doing all this kind of activities. And actually Dr. Hussein Qazaz or Dr. Sif Al-Fatah or Dr. Assam would be struggling to convince donors who gave millions and millions of dollars for food, water and sanitation to give hundreds of thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars to do the history, the research and others. I think that um, leads perfectly to the uh, next question, yeah. um, which is in it's in regards to public opinion, public culture, in regards to charitable work. Yeah. The earlier statement of uh, building uh, people would rather build mosques yeah. rather than building people. How can we change that culture? What could we do to change that culture? And how do we uh, how do we educate our communities on this? This is what the Prophet ﷺ had been doing in Mecca all the time. There was no resources, but he was focusing on the individuals. The individuals over the first 13 years who managed after being mentored, after being brought up or coached. I, let, me, let me talk about the, the new terminology. Mentored, coached like yourself. You have this kind of internship in uh, and had, somebody has to be mentoring you. If nobody's mentoring you, it's a waste of time. I'm just telling you. If nobody's mentoring you in your training and, and your actually what the what your internship, it's a waste of time. You have to have a gray hair or bald man to be mentoring you. I give you one example. When I was a medical doctor, okay, I used to go to the world round. Okay, the senior consultant or the professor used to come in the morning to the world round where there are actually nurses, uh, sisters, uh, junior doctors, senior doctors, and medical students. You know what the professor was to say? Go to the nurses, to the sisters, and to the junior doctors, and bring the medical student, bring home. And telling them, you have to teach him or her everything. It's your duty as a nurse, it's your duty as a sister, 
because he was investing in the new doctor. Actually, this is what actually we need to teach our people. If you have all this money, you don't know how to spend it. Of course, you'll waste it. If you have all these resources in your organization, I know organizations cover their mistakes by overspending, not by overthinking. Actually, not by trying. You say we lost hundred thousand. Okay, give another hundred thousand from some other donor. It's wrong. You should not lose the first hundred thousand, or you should not have this theft happen to you. Actually, you have to 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 build the capacity of the young generation to enable them to stand up, to know what to do, actually, and to prevent things from happening. What you are suffering on this. Uh, Brother Mikhail, is what we call it succession planning. Is what we call it uh, building the uh, capacity of the younger generation, like yourself and others, like actually involving women in the organization, because women bring different cultures, different feeling, different atmosphere. Youth also bring different culture, feeling, atmosphere, because they are very fast. You have a speed of 200 miles a second. My speed may be about 40 miles an hour. And they have to bring you to the organization. Succession planning, building future leadership, as well as involving young people and women in the organization. Actually, to answer the question that you mentioned. One of the other common questions, and it was a theme that was uh, highlighted in the forum and the interactions in the forum, was that there were many people that they highlighted the importance of uh, linking humanitarian work and research institutions in universities and research centers. Of course we need universities. Of course we need research centers. We need them. Because if you want to impact a government decision, you don't go by yourself and make emotional speech. Not enough, not good enough. It has to be a research-based uh, result. And you have the raw material, okay, the data. Like any organization, if I mention Muslim Aid, Muslim Hand, Islamic Relief, Human Appeal, Khair Foundation, they have tens of offices, plethora of information. This is jewel, more than the mine, the, 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 the mine gold. The gold, the gold mine, the, mine. the gold mine. But we don't choose it. We can be, build a partnership with a credible, organi- or credible, a credible research center or credible university to give them the raw material and ask them to change it. If the research comes out from the university, the government will listen to it. But if the research comes out from your organization, nobody will take notice. You might say that I don't have money for it, for research. I said, why don't you sit down as a group of organization dividing the budget? If the research is costing 100,000, you can collect five or six or 10 organization, and each one of them will put 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000. And it will come out from the collective. And this is something which you can do. But, but to go after 30, 40 years, of working in the field with no research mentality is fatal. And you will never be able to impact any government decision. You said there's one, one last um, comment by somebody called Nu'man al Hudifi. He said, unfortunately, all of these Islamic values have been abandoned and there are still slaves and servants in Arab societies and Arab countries as, as he attributes to his own country, Yemen. Uh, a country which does not have a civil society sector is a fragile country. Very easily could be infiltrated by terrorist group and being brought down to its knees. They don't understand the value of civil society organizations whether they are Islamic or secular or 
socialist, whatever you call it. We need it. We need them. Because they are the founding, solidifying network of the country itself. Connecting the rules together. And they are the first uh, organization to see the danger or the problem when it was very, very small before you. Unfortunately, nowadays, when you militarize the, pol the political scheme or you reduce democracy to zero or you securitize the political scheme and you reduce the civil liberty space to zero to strangulate all the organization, that's what you find in different countries, not only in the East, but in the West. Okay? So what we need to explain to the governments and the government officers, look at the West, they are using the local civil society organization to complement the social service program. In UK, for your information, we did a research about the local small civil Muslim civil society organization. You know how many organizations we have here in UK? Muslim ones? 450. You know how many of them are headed by women? 45%. You know how much they help Muslims and non-Muslim? 42% of their fund goes to the non-Muslim. This is different to the stereotype against Islam, that Islam is a religious of radicalism, extremism, and Islam is the religious of male. What defines Muslim organization? Muslim-led. I don't want to say Muslim as theology, but Muslim-led organization. And most of this woman organization were just yani, small organizations, 30,000 pounds, 50,000 pounds, yani, they, but they want to do something. Like your auntie, my auntie, my sister, my daughter, my friend, want to do something. They can't just sit idle because they don't have money. And alhamdulillah, more than 450 of them being established in this country. Actually, nobody knows about them. We should celebrate it. The role of women in Islam. Not to be seen, but actually women have no role. Young people have no role. But like women have role and they started this. This is plus the 150 international ones including Islamic Leave, Penny Appeal, Muslim Hand, and all this. Some of them are very good. Some of them, you have to put a question mark with them as well. And that brings an end to the set of questions regarding the forum. Maybe we can ask... Uh, yeah, so uh, if anybody has any questions to... Uh, Brother Ihab, to make a comment Inshallah. on the meeting. He was there, sharing some sessions. He said... Uh, And then we'll open the discussion for all of you. Ask any question. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum to everyone. Uh, uh, I think uh, attending such uh, an interesting uh, reunion is uh, a, a tipping point in the humanitarian work because it is not uh, the conventional forum of talking about how we can raise funds or how we can solve some kind of uh, crisis, but it is about setting uh, new strategies to address the new challenges that are facing uh, the world uh, in general and the humanitarian, humanitarian work in specific. The, the whole world is moving into new horizons. Uh, new political systems, uh, new ways to, to, to see development, new ways to communicate between different parties, and still the humanitarian work that is adopted by the Islamic uh, organizations is the same since 30 or 40 years. Uh, more than that, uh, though we are talking about uh, Muslim organizations or Muslim-led organizations as the initial questions, Frankly speaking, it has nothing to do with Islam when it comes to the uh, management system. We are following the same management systems 
as the very old traditional functional management system of the international organizations uh, that themselves right now they had really uh, they really passed it and, and left it <laughs> behind their backs and looking for new uh, progressive systems so so we are we are really in a very bad need to such type of a conference or meeting in order to uh, seek actual new strategies uh, and this was a, a, a very good starting point uh, for the meeting uh, a very important a very important uh, takeaway for me uh, was clearly identify the difference between uh, addressing a crisis mm. versus addressing development, <laughs> mm. All right? So most of the uh, humanitarian work mm. was really concerned with addressing right. crisis. And, 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 and this had ruled all types of actions, systems, uh, organizations, and, 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 and frankly speaking, you cannot even in the new types of crisis address them as an intermittent uh, suddenly happening. We cannot address the Syrian condition as if it is a crisis that, that happened once and it will not happen again. It is continuing since 10 years right now. We cannot address it as a sudden crisis or it is, it, it, it is uh, a, a very deep entrenched problem uh, th that is manifested in so many ways, in so many places, mm. right? Uh, we can see the Ukrainian problem, for example, very similar to the, to the Syrian one. Mm. If we would have addressed mm. the Syrian problem with the proper strategy, mm. and if we would have looked at it from a developmental perspective, mm. and with a different approach, you could have right now different ways to address the ukrainian problem right. all right so so uh, the, 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 the 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 main the main difference between addressing crisis and addressing development as we've just mentioned Th the last point uh, that uh, had been touched but i wish to to see with the future work with dr yeah. banna inshallah is the focus on the beneficiary the focus on the human being we are talking humanitarian. We are not talking about organization. We are talking about human, mm. human being, the, the the unit that is forming these societies and communities. We need to focus more on them. We need yes. to understand them more. We need to address their overall concern, not mm. to address a problem like uh, education or a problem like health, mm. because nutrition <laughs> impacts health. Mm. <laughs> and education impacts everything <laughs> and right. and so on you, you cannot just segregate the problems and yeah. address them separately you need to have a very deep generic holistic vision mm. about the targeted beneficiary which is a human being thank you, thank you dr manna for okay. this uh, chance thank you okay anyone would like to make a comment from the people or ask questions <laughs> See, my question is quite broad, maybe not totally relevant to the topic discussion today, but um, as we're coming towards times of financial crisis, recession is looming for us as fundraisers like myself, Mikhail and Shahid, because you've been through this as well, like 2008 for example, what would your advice be in terms of preparing for it? Is there something we have to change in our strategies? Maybe changing the meta? What's, what's your advice for us? As an organization or individual? Both. Both, I'd say. Uh, as an organization, actually, we have to build more bridges with other organizations. We should not be working in, in silo, is that right? So we should be actually working together, networking, communication, partnership. Because our resources become very 
little limited, limited unfortunately. And uh, even not only communication on financial uh, contribution, but also on knowledge, experience as well. As individual, like actually we should be educating the individuals. Particularly a lot of people will be losing their jobs or being sitting at home. This might have a social problem at home, might, have, might create a psychosocial problem as well, might lead to divorce like in certain countries. It's happening, unfortunately, without mentioning the name of the, the names of the countries, because of the man is sitting at home, has been has no jobs, become unemployed. When it happens, you find the frustration of the man, maybe beating the wife, maybe beating the children, all these kind of things. Should be anticipating the growth of uh, the psychosocial problem in a community which it was a stable community. And here, we might be uh, theologically, philosophically, and culturally thinking about different ways of approaching our problems. Maybe engaging some of those expert individuals in, uh, who actually lost their jobs in our program. It needs, to be very honest, to have a collective, uh, building a collective vision for the country on organization level, one side, as well as on the individual level, on the citizen's level. It cannot be one size can fit all. You see, we have to sit down together, we have to, uh, to forget the ego of the logo, actually, which is very, very bad, and the ego of the leadership of our chairman, or our president, or our manager, or our director. It's deadly fatal. We have to realize that we are British, not we are Pakistani anymore. When you are here, I saw some of our uh, brothers and sisters just all the time jumping to Pakistan. So, okay, fine, I have no problem with this. But there's many countries like Pakistan. There's many countries like India. Prove that you are citizen of the country that you are living in. Otherwise, you will be considered a ghetto mindset, creating a ghetto mindset in this country. And we know what's happening all the time to the people who create this ghetto mindset, what the extreme right or left wing will do to them. So these sort of things we have to believe. Are you here? Why should you support, as, as uh, Norman Tibbet said in the 80s, if you want to see where the Asian community go, or swing, go on to, uh, to the cricket ground when they play with England. And see, <laughs> is that right? Remember that. <laughs> Remember that. Even, even with this gold medal to the Pakistani wrestler, heavy, heavyweight uh, lifter, isn't it? Everybody was jubilant. Okay, fine, I have no problem. So, so have you been jubilant? that the women football team have won European championship? Have you seen the final? You? I saw highlights. <laughs> <laughs> see? I don't want you to see the, 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 the winning goal <laughs> woman when she took off her, her, her T-shirt because I was actually teased by one of my friends actually told me have you seen the, <laughs> of course I saw the, the match from A to Z, actually. But it's actually, this is your country. Yes. If you decided to live somewhere else, go and live somewhere else. Okay, and this is the problem which is affecting on our economical ground, on social ground, on philosophical ground, on cultural ground, on even on religious ground. If they found that your religion is encompassing others, bridging to others, communicating with others, they will love your religion. They will love you. They will respect you. They will respect you. This actually, economical, uh, uh, responding to a recession, economic uh, crisis is not one man show. It's not one organization. It's, one, it's not one political party. It's the collective of the people in the country. Yeah. Yes.
Assalamu alaikum. One is personal question and the one is... Um, I'm married with five children. <laughs> um, alhamdulillah, I've been with Human Relief Foundation for 10 years. And I've been given the job uh, to look after London office uh, last week. How can I be successful like you? And second question is, do you think, as you mentioned a few times, Muslim charities are losing out, as you mentioned, we are here, we are British, on British donors by using Quran and Hadith? Okay, first of all, be yourself. Don't be like Mikael. <laughs> Mikael is Mikael. But the success comes from, first of all, your intention. Second, your belief in the community and in the cause that you stand for. Thirdly, your dedication and commitment. Okay. Fourthly, your manner, being humble and show humility. Fifth is your uh, closeness to the people who need your help at any time. Not only you come to his father because he needs his money. But when his father has a problem, you turn your back to him. Okay? Actually, this is number five or number six. Number seven, you invest in the community. You invest in the children. You invest in, 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 in the woman, in the community. Because you have to pay back what you have raised. Not all the money should go out. Some money has to be stay behind. And if you focus on this without waiting to become a leader, the community will make you a leader. Because a leadership uh, making is a, a, what do you call it? Is a, is a witness that the community would like you to become their leaders. It's not because my father is, or my mother is, or my degree is. No, it's the community see you. The community listens to you. The community observes you. The community knows you inside out. And the community felt that you are honest. The most important thing in your character is a sidq, which is the Prophet was sadiq al-amin, the trustworthiness. Actually, this is actually the most important thing. But actually not uh, to be like me. It's like to be like the Prophet Raise your bar. Keep, keep, keep raising your bar. But when you come to me, you lower your bar. Okay, this is number one question. Second one? Second one. I was, um, um, I was Overusing saying, the verses. Yes. Is the, is the Muslim charity losing out on British people on donations? What do you mean by British people? Like British. No, no Muslims. No, Muslim. The non-Muslim. Yeah. I think Muslim organization or so, or Muslim-led organization are not only losing out on the English non-Muslim, but on the Muslim as well. Because okay. a lot of Muslims now become secular, become, uh, يعني, maybe some of them became atheist, mm -hmm. and others. Even some different generation do not believe in your approach. And they can say, stop talking about, about Quran and the Hadith. Tell me what is the value of your, the social impact of your project in my society. When those young donors, highly qualified, shrewd, and you know what they're talking about, they found that when you say 0% admin, they believe that you are a liar. You are a liar. You know why? Because nothing called 0% admin. And even if you have another fund for the 0% admin, you have to, to have to declare it. Because any in-kind income to you is an income to the organization. I have no problem of you come to tell me at the end of the day, I have a contribution from a donor of $1 million or $2 million or $2 million pound to the administration. That means my income is not 10 million, it's 12 million. Two million of them was for the administration, paid by somebody else. If you don't say this to me, you are a liar. And your young donors do not trust you anymore because you are extremely traditional and don't say the truth. 
And some people twist the arm or twist the understanding of the verses of the Quran and the understanding of the meaning of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Okay? And now people with Google, Sheikh, you have good Sheikh Google, huh? You know Sheikh Google? Maudana Google, Mufti, Mufti Google. I like, I like the translation. <laughs> Instead of saying... <laughs> carpets. Okay. Talk about carpets. I said, what, what's carpet? The man was talking about the people like you to invest in you. And Sajid and Sajada. <laughs> خدت بالك في الأول ما الكربت أشتري وات كربت حتى لما أنا قرأت أنا بس شيخ جوجل ها دونت فولو يوم 24/7 so with these things you have to be very honest you have to say let me let me take you to the honesty no international work and take it from me will be less than 15 percent admin no could go to 20 or 25 percent. You know why? Because they have an operation in the headquarters and they have different operation in 10, 20 or 15 countries. And each operation costs money. When the donor come and tell you, I'm not going to give you any admin, tell him, thank you, sir, I don't want your money. Keep it for you. Try to learn to say no, to be honest. Because the younger generation lost confidence in the so-called Muslim-led charities because of this hiding, unfortunately. You want another? You want to ask question? No, I don't have any questions. Okay. You want to ask questions, Yad? Doctor. Thank you. You want to ask question? Yeah, one question. Oh. Um, when you spoke about the forum. And even the last two questions that you answered, I think they sort of in some way linked to this question. One key aspect of many uh, Muslim-led organizations and charities is uh, social activism, as, as you know, as Islamic yeah. Relief as well. How do you define the boundary of social, social justice, social activism, and uh, where it doesn't become overzealotism or, extreme, uh, overzealotism or extremism or fundamentalism, you know? And how do you keep in a good framework with that? Especially working in, the, especially being in the charity sector as well. Uh, can you explain more for the, the viewers okay. that don't understand your so, uh, social activism? High level <laughs> philosophical language. So social activism, social social justice. When we see something going on wrong, for example, we saw what happened in Palestine last uh, week. We naturally we get angry when we see images on the on the yeah. news and on the TV okay. and the screens. Uh, we go out. Some people protest, some people propose, some people, you know, they, you know, they do things. But then sometimes it goes, you do see certain people, they go a bit too far. So how do you yeah. stop that from happening, yes. especially in the charity, charity sector as well? All right. Let me say something. I, we, I said at the very beginning from the talk of Sheikh Hassan, uh, what do you call it? The Hezb al-Fudul. Hezb al-Fudul? Sorry, Hezb al-Fudul. Hezb al-Fudul. Syndrome. Here, why only you stand for Palestine? Don't stand for Ukrainian people. Don't stand for the DRC people, the Democratic Republic of Congo people. They are have five million internets placed. I don't tell you, don't stand for Palestine, for Yemen, for Syria. But I am telling you as well, there's a lot of other problems in Latin America, in different parts of the world. This is helpful fudul has to be for everybody. Helpful fudul syndrome has to be sustainable and for everybody. If people see you that you are standing for Ukraine, they will stand for with you for Palestine and India and Bangladesh and others. But you do, if you don't stand for the problem, they will see you that you are building the ghettos of the, this kind of, of segregation. Can I touch on that? Yes, touch, please. Come on. So, <laughs> why, so why, why people don't have that understanding, what you just said? I mean, it's not just... Selective. Yeah, why is it selective and why is it not just uneducated? Educated, sheikh, scholars... practical example. Please. Okay, a practical example. When Ukraine problem happened... Please. 
I mentioned this before. I was begging, begging at least a handful or a dozen of Muslim charities to stand up next to the people of Ukraine. It has nothing to do with the political or the military or whatever it is. We have Afghanistan problem, we have East Africa. Uh, I said, I have no problem. Even a letter of sympathy. A letter of sympathy. Because you people are living in Europe, living in the middle of the West. And this is the major problem hitting the West very badly. And people will make you accountable later on of not doing anything. No, 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 no. We have a campaign for, Afghan for Afghanistan. We have a campaign for East Africa. We have a campaign for Palestine. Yes, how your campaign? Ukraine does not need your money. Because there's a lot of uh, uh, governments giving money. But it needs a sympathy. And here... The humanitarian, the Islamic humanitarian, this is not helpful for do, uh, helpful for do, sorry. This is not helpful for do. Because helpful for do is not one size. Helpful for do is encompassing everyone. I stand with the weak and the vulnerable who are treated unjustly, who are beaten, who are tortured. You see, if I find a young non-Muslim girl is raped in front of me. He said, oh my God, she deserve it? No. She's like my daughter. She's like my daughter, or like my sister, or like my wife. So for anybody, this is the mentality which wrong understanding. Even in zakah, there's two or three categories of spending the money on the Muslim. One of them, we call it al-mu'allafati qulubim. The second is fi sabillah. Why we restrict our money to a certain people only, actually? And we can widen this to include other people. And this is, unfortunately, if we call them ulama, they're not ulama. They are village, village readers of, of notebooks of fiqh and hadith. You got it? I say it again. They are very village readers of notebooks, not the textbook. If you want to be alim in Islam, you have to master the Arabic language. And I'm saying it with arrogance. Without the Arabic language, you have to question yourself. You have to question yourself. Because the metaphor and the extrapolation of the proverbs of the same verb is incredible, is are incredible. From one verb, when you change, you know, tashkil is more tashkil. What do you call it in English? Huh? The, the vowels. The, the vowels. It gives you different meanings. That's why, coming back, village notebook readers, not ulama. You got it? But we call them. We call ourselves ulama, scholars, mufti, and whatever we call it. They have to be educated. Education is not only on the theology side of it, but on the social side of it as well. Anything else? Anything else? Anything else? Anything else? Um, just... Uh... Extending a bit more on my previous question regarding recession. So, would you say that as charity organizations, we shouldn't worry so much that people's giving nature might not be so high in the coming 6 to 12 months, and it's more so just like um, in donations? Yeah, um, so that it won't be so high in the next 6 to 12 months, and it's just a phase and things will get better? Or should we be thinking of particular strategies to try to raise more funds? Um, if that makes sense. It, it's both of them. It's both of them. You have to have invention of fundraising, which is in-kind fundraising, utilizing the resources of the community. Because like, well, like I mentioned earlier, on, you might have professors can come for free. You might have lecturers can come for free. Consultants can come for free to do all this sort of thing. You have to have tighten your belt policy to pass this uh, uh, phase 
by not not overspending but try to be meticulously knowing how to raise and how to spend as as well building the partnership actually to reduce the expenditure partnership in one project like if we say that instead of each one of us going to the same village or to the same project doing the same thing without communicating let us do the same thing together and instead of me spending hundred thousand he's spending hundred thousand we spend two three hundred thousand divided by six or seven organizations this was like more openness more communication more networking okay your last call as you have the citation <coughs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن للمتقين منفازا حدائق وأعنابا وكواعب أترابا وكأسا دهاقا لا يسمعون فيها لغوا ولا كذابا جزاء من ربك عطاء رب السماوات والأرض وما بينهما الرحمن رب السماوات والأرض وما بينهما الرحمن لا يملكون منه خطابا إن للمتقين تقين مفازا حدا إنق وأعنابا وكواعب أترابا وكأسا دهاقا لا يسمعون فيها لغوا ولا كذابا جزاء من ربك عطاء رب السماوات والأرض وما بينهما الرحمن لا يملكون منه خطابا يوم يقوم الروح يوم يقوم الروح يوم يقوم الروح والملائكة صفا لا 
يَعْلَمُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَذِنَ لَهُ الرَّحْمَنُ وَقَالَ صَوَابًا يَوْمَ يَقُومُ صدق الله العظيم